welcome to Wealth Well Done. Together, we'll cover a wide range of important topics surrounding money and the impact it has on our lives. From the sophisticated and highly valuable planning techniques of the ultra wealthy to the commonly underutilized biblical teachings. Together, we'll work to improve our relationship with money and our effectiveness in stewarding it well. Here's your host, Eric Scoville. All right. Welcome to the 21st episode of the Wealth Well Done podcast, where we go after the tactical, practical, and spiritual advice to help you do your wealth well done. Last uh, The last couple of weeks, we've had a guest on named Jay Link. Jay went over some great content about stewardship and, and giving. And this week, we are going to dig into taxes. Um, so a few weeks back, we had done uh, a couple or a solo cast where I dug in on estate planning. Um, this time we're going to do similar similar uh, fashion here, and we're going to talk about taxes. This is a loaded topic, um, so we are going to start with the full disclaimer again, and then we'll we'll get into this here. Um, th- as I've said all along, you know the the, sh- the show is, is informational, it's educational, uh, should not be construed as investment advice. You should consult with the financial advisor to help determine <clears throat> the best options for your particular circumstances. No statement made during this show shall constitute tax or legal advice, and our firm is not endorsed by the United States government or any other governmental agency. The information and opinions construed herein presented by third parties have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable. Completeness and accuracy cannot be guaranteed. So that's the legal side of this. Please just understand that I want want to be informative here, but um, you need to absolutely balance this off of someone who is a licensed professional who is uh, looking at this from your point of view. A little bit of background on on me and my practice. So I've I've got a uh, what's called an RIA, and so that basically means I'm a financial planner, and we're transitioning our, our practice into a, a multifamily office. Um, but I am not a CPA. I am not a lawyer. Um, I put a lot of emphasis in these two areas: taxes and some of the legal work for our clients. Um, many lawyers and CPAs tend to shy away from some of these topics due to liability, and it's totally understandable. If you think about the volume of clients that they serve, um, they don't charge enough to be able to spend the time to walk through uh, walk through all of the details behind some of the strategies that we're going to be talking about here in the coming weeks. And so it makes complete sense that they're not, uh, unless you are paying them for a high level service, um, they're not going to expose themselves to the liability that comes with making some of these recommendations to you. Um, and so typically, uh, when I come in with, with my clients as we're meeting with the CPA, especially on the, on the tax side, is I'm, on, I'm more so giving them permission to do the strategies that otherwise they, they wouldn't do uh, just because they know that I'm going to be heavily engaged with the client and helping with the complexities there. So if you as a client were to bring some of these uh, ideas to your CPA, and again, we're not going to get too much into those complex ideas today. This is We're going to start with a little bit more of the bas- basics and build into this over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but if you were to take some of these strategies and bring these to your CPA and prove that you can execute them, then that's when you'll see them light up and you'll see them come alive with some of the the strategies that you might have been craving all along. Uh, But unless you're pushing the envelope there, then they're probably not going to offer them to you. And it makes a lot of sense. So taxes are the probably the number one thing that clients initially come to me for is the help on the the tax planning side. Um, And it makes a lot of sense here. They put all their effort into making the money. Um, And and so obviously that takes that takes a heavy lift to, to make the money that that someone makes, um, but it takes significantly less of a lift to be able to uh, retain more of that by by not spending so much in in, in taxes. Uh, Tom Wheelwright is the he's a pretty famous CPA. He's the CPA for Robert Kiyosaki, who's the rich dad poor dad. Um, <clears throat> Tom Wheelwright has a, a quote that's out there where he talks about basically there's seven thousand pages of the tax code roughly. And uh, there's one line in it that says that all income is taxable. Uh, basically, un- unless we say it isn't, all income is taxable. And there's 29, 30 pages of charts that, that help illustrate that. And then the rest of that tax code is built around how do you reduce your tax liability. And so a key thing as we start looking at taxes is not that the, uh, the rich people just avoid taxes somehow and they're cheating everyone. 
uh, it's understanding that the the idea is to partner with the IRS. If they put that much emphasis into the tax code um, <clears throat> to help you understand ways that you can reduce your tax liability, then what, what they're encouraging you to do is to partner with them to accomplish some of the objectives that they have set out for you. And therefore, if you do that, they will incentivize you to help you keep more of your money. So you think about this. Social Security is not something that can sustain all Americans through, for their retirement alone. So they have provided tax incentives to help you save into your 401k and your IRAs. In a very similar fashion, housing. Our country needs housing, and rather than have all that be government provided, the government has provided substantial tax benefits um, to those people who will choose to invest in housing as a real estate investor. Um, there's also things around energy. We say that we are trying to go go completely green and, and wipe out um, fossil fuel usage. But at the same time, we have tremendous uh, tax credits available to people who invest in energy when done in the proper way. So anyways, uh, the idea being here, you're not trying to do something shady behind the back of the IRS. You're trying to partner with them. They have set up the rules in the first place. It's not just done by congressmen who are trying to line their own pockets. There are ways, reasons that they set these rules up this way. and We are trying to partner with them to help um, to help accomplish what they're trying to accomplish and let, let those tax benefits then uh, you know, make a bigger impact on us. So as I said here, um, there is mountains of information to unpack uh, when trying to do uh, some information on taxes. And so what we're going to do is we are going to start start fairly slow here and build up in the complexity. Um, we'll just kind of keep running through these week by week to do a, a good section on taxes um, and have these be you know, progressively more complicated. The, the reason, and so I, I was thinking about this, you know, I, I don't, you know, this podcast is, while available to anyone, I'm trying to specifically design this for people who are of a higher net worth. And you would assume that someone who's of that higher net worth probably doesn't need to go back to the basics on taxes. Uh, yet, as I have found, no matter the net worth, like, and we're talking with people who are in the high nine figures and, and anything in between there, most people are relatively ignorant when it comes to taxes. I don't mean that as a as a, um, you know, I'm not trying to to be, be negative on them, but but that relative ignorance. So so let me qualify that. So if someone's making, let's call it half a million dollars, so you're making five hundred thousand dollars in salary or owner's retained earnings um, for the level of expertise that you bring to your career, your profession, um, you're going to pay without without special tax planning. You're going to pay roughly one hundred seventy thousand dollars in income taxes based off of that. Um, after you factor in the other types of taxes you pay besides income taxes, you're paying well over two hundred thousand um, dollars in taxes here. And so, on on half a million dollars of income, forty percent of that is going toward taxes. And so, the question being, you know, back to my comment about you know people being relatively ignorant, is would you say with the level of expertise that you have in your career, are you forty percent, you know, as as um, qualified to to speak about taxes and most people are not. And so that's where um, it just really pays to, to understand the basics behind this basics behind taxes since so much of your income goes there unless you are uh, more forward thinking. A little background on taxes. There's a lot of people who um, feel like um, income taxes is, is unconstitutional. I uh, did pull up something here in Article 16, uh, where it says the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. Um, the biblical approach behind taxes. So Matthew 22, 17 through 21 is uh, the they're trying to kind of catch Jesus in, in a... Uh, in a pickle here, and they say, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the, for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. Now, there's a there's actually a lot more into this one as well. Um, we... Uh, we can get into that at a later time about property taxes and the idea of what actually belonged to Caesar there. So the only land, the only tax that was applicable in Jesus's day there was a land tax, so property taxes, not 
not an income tax here, but uh, that's another it's another topic. So Romans 13, 6 and 7, Paul goes into this as well. He said, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And so to the point of all this stuff, I am not trying to help you cheat the system and not pay taxes. I'm trying to help you partner with the IRS. So that way, if you can do things that they want you to do, um, then they will offer you a benefit. And that's that's really what we're trying to do is how do you take advantage of the um, the opportunities are out, that are out there for you so you can retain more of the uh, money that you've earned. Important to understand the different types of taxes. Um, there are many. It's not just income tax. Income taxes is where a lot of the focus is. Um, but we'll get into a few few others here. And so where you live matters. It matters greatly. Uh, they call this the blended tax rate. Uh, property taxes, obviously, is a, is a main one here. I, I referenced the, you know, the, the biblical version of this. Uh, I think in the in the last episode with Jay Link, he, we uh, referenced one of his articles on tithing and where this is really a land tax. So um, that'd, be, that'd be a good one for you to go back and find there. Illinois, the state that I live in, is second only to New Jersey in terms of the highest property tax per state. Um, so that's a, that's a very significant deal, especially if you are looking at rental properties. Um, so not only for your home, you think about, about the the type of house, uh, the taxes that a house, you know, someone that has a $2 million house in in another state might pay roughly the same taxes as someone who's got about a $200,000 house here in Illinois. So there's a, there's a big difference there. Um, the, um, and so that's a huge raise that people have found when they have left some of these states with high property taxes. The um, income tax is a, is a big one. We're going to spend a lot more time on that. Um, focusing more on the federal side of this. But at the state level, again, where you live matters. Um, Illinois, for this example, is, is 4.95%. There are um, a number of states that have no state income tax. Let me pull those up here. So you got Texas, Tennessee, Wyoming, South Dakota, Florida, Alaska, Washington, and Nevada all have no state income tax. Um, New Hampshire is is a little bit in there. They they have no income tax for the most part, except that four percent tax on dividend earnings. So, when you compare that to states like New York or Oregon that are nearly at fifteen percent, again you can look at a fifteen percent increase in your in your income um, just by the state that you live in. Um, sales tax is another one um, that's dependent. You know, oftentimes the local government has a has a sales tax but the states also do as well whereas again a state like new hampshire they have no sales tax so there are other states that have no sales tax um and then when you go into this so there's fuel tax entertainment tax uh, and then there's there's plenty more of these as well but there are a lot of taxes that build up um to produce this blended tax rate for you of, of what are you actually paying in taxes if the only way you look at taxes is just around income you're you're missing a significant piece of this um, we can get into corporate tax, uh, corporate taxes for C-Corps. And so you'll hear that that's a, a typical thing that's talked about in the media re revolving around the government's um, you know, policies there. Currently, that's at 21%. That's a pretty low rate historically, um, at least as of late. The state tax um, is currently at $12.92 million per person. So you have a $12.92 million exclusion. Um, husband's and wife would have double that, that you can pass down to any one of your choosing without having uh, additional taxes owed on that. But if you go over that, then you would be subject to a tax that um, builds up, scales up to 40% um, of all funds that are over that. So when you look at a state tax, that's a, that's a big piece. That one is going to, is set to sunset here. And so you're going to see those numbers uh, more than cut in half here in the coming years, unless unless uh, a change is made in the legislation. Also, that would be <clears throat> helpful to understand a little bit of where we're at historically in our tax rate. In the year 1940, uh, an income of $4,000, if you had over $4,000 of income, that was only taxed at an 8% rate. What was what was $4,000 uh, equivalent to today? That'd be equivalent to $87,000. So if you had an $87,000 income in 1940, that was taxed at 8%. 
um, if you had an income of 1.3 million uh, uh, to in today's dollars, it was 60,000 then in today's dollars, that's, that would have been taxed at 51%. Uh, interestingly enough, in the year 1940, if you had an income over $5 million, that was taxed at the rate of 79%. That $5 million in 1940, uh, 1940s dollars would be equivalent to $109 million today. So kind of a bizarre number that they would throw that all the way in there um, then, but kind of progressing along here, going to the 1960s and 1963. Uh, again, they, their bracket still showed an income of 4,000. Um, that was, which was then an equivalent of $40,000. So 1940, that was equivalent of 87,000. Now, you know, in 1963, that was equivalent to 40,000. And that had moved from an 8% tax to a 22% tax. Um, a $32,000 income in 1963, equivalent of 321,000 today was taxed at 50%. And then <clears throat> this one gets a little bit more extreme. Anything over 400,000, which would be $4 million today was taxed at a rate of 91%. So when you hear this, you know, people talk about, you know, rates were as high as, uh, actually 94, 95 rates were as high as 94%. And that was for income over 200,000. So if you made over $200,000 in 19, uh, the 1944, 45 range, which was equivalent to 3.5 million today, then you were taxed at 94%. So we historically, um, have been at a much higher tax rate than where we're at today. Currently, uh, in the U S here for 2023, any income over 22,000 uh, is taxed at the 12%. And there's there's a bunch of other brackets here, but just uh, kind of referencing this <clears throat> at a $22,000 income, you'd be taxed at 12% for anything above that. Uh, the top tax bracket is 37%, which is for any, any income over $693,750. So um, historically, we are at a very low tax rate compared to where we used to be. Um, although you can certainly make an argument that income shouldn't be taxed in the first place. The another big thing that uh, is, is often in the news is about, you know, the rich and, and how the ultra wealthy uh, never, you know, they don't pay their fair share of taxes. So uh, here's some data here. The top 1% of wage earners pay more than 42% of all federal income taxes for the year. So top 1% make up 42% um, there. And the the top 50% of earners pay 97.7% of all taxes received by the treasury. Uh, top 10% of earners pay 74% of taxes. There's another good one here. The 400 wealthiest families um, pay an average uh, income tax rate of 8.2%. So that's that's important when we look at this. The um, the effective tax rate. So we talked about your blended tax rate is has to do with all these other taxes um, that come together. The effective tax rate shows what what your actual taxes were compared to your actual um, your income before we get into this whole thing called your adjusted gross income or your modified adjusted gross income. And all that data is either from the White House website or the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Going into the IRS and where the IRS is at, uh, some important changes that have happened to the IRS over the years. Um, in 1942, they passed the Revenue Act, which basically took the uh, increased taxes and the number of citizens that would be subject to the income tax, uh, and that doubled the personal income tax revenue from 3.4 billion in 1941 to 8 billion in 1942. So um, they passed that one one act there, and that basically doubled the the revenue. In 1943, they made it mandatory for employers to withhold taxes uh, from employee wages. In 1986, um, you see a they they uh, did the Tax Reform Act, and this is where they cut individual tax rates. The top rate went from 50% down to 20%, uh, but it did increase taxes on capital gains from 20% to 28%. Um, as we get into stuff here, so the next thing to to dig into is is income tax, and so how do you you know I want to break down a little bit about income tax here um, from a federal level, what we're often looking at is what is your modified adjusted gross income? And so we'll, what you need to understand, again, we go back to those tax brackets, you know, the your taxes progress as you go up, the, the um, you pay a 10% tax bracket on all the income you make up to $22,000, uh, then you go to 12% and the 22% bracket, uh, the next bracket is 24%, and then on that next year, you're paying 24% up to the $364,000, this again for 2023. 
Um, and then you have a couple more tax brackets, 32, 35, the last one being 37%, which is 37% for all income over 693,000. Um, like we mentioned, you got states that have different tax rates. So often like, so, so a, a high earner in Illinois is going to be paying the 37% to the federal government and 5% to the state. Um, there's alternative minimum tax in there as well that can also be factored in. Uh, and this is for your active income. Then you have passive income. And so passive income, um, this is going to include rental income, uh, unless we're getting into real estate professional status, which is something that we will address in one of these uh, progressive tax videos. We're going to dig deep into real estate professional status. So that way you can understand one of the main ways that um, that people use um, real estate investment to offset their active income and lower their taxes. Um, dividends are also treated as passive income. And so dividends from a stock or some other investment, these could be taxed at 0, 15, or 20%, um, depending on your earnings. And, and so that's for qualified dividends. Qualified dividends can be taxed at that lower tax bracket. Um, if they're non-qualified dividends, then they would be taxed as ordinary income. Uh, non-qualified dividend would be from a, stock, a common stock or mutual funds that you've held for less than 60 days. Uh, it, if you're having preferred stock, it'd be you'd have to hold it for 90 days. Um, any type of REITs, so real estate investment trust uh, or master limited partnerships, MLPs, um, money market accounts, uh, if there's a one-time dividend or even like hedging positions and options trading, anything like that would be a non-qualified dividend and that's treated as ordinary income. Another type of passive um, income is capital gains. And so capital gains fall into two Two categories, you have long-term capital gains. This is anything you've held for a year and a day or longer. And again, back to that 0, 15, 20 rule. So if you have a adjusted gross income of less than $89,250, then you actually pay 0% um, up to that 89,250 range. So 0% um, on your capital gains then uh, up till $553,850, you would pay a long-term capital gains rate of 15%, and if anything over 553, you would then pay 20% 20, 20 um, there on your long-term. Short-term capital gains are anything you've held for uh, less than a year, and that is treated as ordinary income. So now we've started to get into some of these things here. Um, before we get into a bunch of the the special you know tax strategies that people use, there's always a fear of an audit around there. So I want to break down audits a little bit more here. Um, you've probably heard about in, in April, you know, the IRS have released the uh, IRA plan, uh, which is to help them increase tax revenue by more than $180 billion. Um, they were going to increase the enforcement um, to ensure tax compliance among high income and high, uh, high net worth individuals. They uh, expect to hire 20,000 new employees in the next two years, and 7,200 of them would be used for enforcement. Um, the new IRS chief said that they would enforce, um, you know, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's pledge to not increase historical audit rates for Americans earning under four hundred thousand um, dollars, and they would base this on the historically low twenty eighteen audit rates. So let's get into audit a little bit. What would trigger an audit? Um, there, pulled up here some you know twelve most identifiable audit triggers. The the ones that stand out the most are a if you've got a high income it's more likely to be audited. Um, if you have excessive deductions, uh, here is, here's probably, well, I guess on the excessive deductions, you know, that might be home office deduction, um, you know, deducting business meals, travel, and entertainment, um, or if you're, you know, claiming 100% of your business use as a vehicle, or um, your vehicle as claiming 100% of that use for the business, um, those things would be more likely to trigger an audit. The claiming a loss on a hobby, is also uh, one that sticks out as a red flag. And here's one of the most interesting ones that's going to lead to our next discussion, and that is Schedule C filers. So a Schedule C filer, this is someone who is a sole proprietor, you know, you've got an LLC, um, and those Schedule C filers are more than a thousand times more likely to, to be audited than an S-Corp. And I, uh, I have actually seen that statistic in a number of places uh, by, by people that I trust, and so that 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 seems like a wild number, but but that's the that's the number that I've seen floating around uh, multiple times out there. That more than a thousand times more likely to get audited as a you know sole proprietor LLC than you are as an S corp. So let's dig into that. 
if I'm an entrepreneur, which entity structure do I choose? Um, sometimes you are limited to what you can choose. If you are a, um, if you have other investors, then if you if you're a, a entity that's got more than 100 investors, then you you have to be a C corp. Inside of C corp, you've got that fixed 21 percent corporate tax rate, um, but you're also subject to double taxation. So you get taxed. Uh, the corporation pays the tax. Uh, on the front end, and then as any dividends are passed on to the investors, then the uh, investors are also taxed at, at whatever those dividends are going to be taxed at for them. And S corp um, is one that uh, it gets a lot more use from from the uh, I would say maybe a little bit more financially savvy uh, and, um, entrepreneurs, and not not always. It doesn't that's not necessarily the case as a blank statement, but. An S corp um, has some more restrictions around it. You have to have meeting minutes. You have to, or you, you have to um, have board meetings. You, you have to um, comply with some more regulation. But what an S corp does that's that's really powerful is you're able to reduce the amount of um, tax you paid, like for FICA. And so when you think about this, I think it's fifteen point three percent that goes to that goes to these type of payroll taxes. And so an S corp requires you to take a salary. Whereas if you are a single member L- single single member LLC, um, you have you have your normal income tax, uh, but you, you pay self employment tax on all the income that you earn. And so as an S corp, you only pay self employment tax on salaries, but not on distributions. So an S corp requires you to have a salary as an owner, even if you're if you're the only you know you're the only employee that the corporation has. You're required to have a salary. Um, You'll see some CPAs go to the subscribe to the idea of 50 50. 50 percent of your income has to go to salary and 50 percent of it has to go to dist- or can go to distributions. Some CPAs will push the issue more and say 30 or 40 percent to salary and the rest to distributions. Um, some will actually file a uh, do a report to decide determine what a fair and reasonable compensation is. They'll do a fair and reasonable compensation study, in which case they're going to figure out how much time did you spend marketing, how many hours do you spend on sales calls, how many hours do you spend cleaning the toilet, how many hours do you spend doing you know bookkeeping type entries, and then assign a dollar uh, a wage to each of those um, each of those job roles, and then use that to determine what your fair uh, compensation would be. <clears throat> the reason this is so important is because if we can take a lower salary and a higher distribution, then we're able to offset or not pay that self-employment tax on all of the distribution. So, uh, as corp, you know, business owner who makes five hundred thousand dollars a year, if they're able to uh, take anywhere from two fifty all the way up to four hundred thousand uh, dollars, if they show that a hundred thousand dollars was a fair and reasonable compensation. Um, then all of that other money is not subject to that extra 15.3% self-employment tax. Those aren't the only factors that you should look at when uh, when choosing which which entity structure you want, but uh, those are maybe a little bit harder to find when you're Googling which, which structure you should look for. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to get some of that information, so I thought that'd be worth sharing. Um, but certainly you need to understand the, the legal protection that each um, offers as well as some of the downsides with these. You know, do you need to file additional taxes. Um, oftentimes you'll see a one S corp set up with a bunch of LLCs underneath them. And the S corp acts as a holding company that all the LLCs funnel into that way. The, um, you're, you're able to reduce the number of taxes that, you know, um, entities that need to file taxes as well. So from a, from an entrepreneur standpoint, if you're trying to decide which, uh, which any structure to use the, the taxes, um, that you pay should absolutely be a, a factor in your decision. All right, I think that's probably a good enough chunk to start with. Um, we'll we'll get in the, the next episode. We'll start to dig into more of the, um, the the ways that you get involved with this. So how to pick the right CPA, how to work with your CPA to help them help maximize what they can bring for you. Uh, we'll start getting into some of the planning stuff. You know, the annual gift exclusion. If you're trying to figure out how to uh, move money out of your estate because you're going to be subject to an estate tax. Uh, which, by the way, I didn't mention this, that the federal state tax is at that $12.92 million, but each state may have their own. Um, if you're lucky enough to live in Maryland, then you actually get both, uh, a, a state tax and an inheritance tax. Um, <clears throat> but either way, a lot of states have, have an estate tax. Um, in Illinois, it's $4 million. So anything above $4 million is taxed in Illinois, uh, I think up to 16%. 
of that. And then um, even though you might still be well under the federal federal exclusion. So um, when you're looking at that, a lot of people start to think about strategies and the annual gift exclusion is one of them where if a husband and wife are trying to move money out of their state and they've got two children that each have four kids, you're actually allowed to give $17,000 per person to anyone you want. So husband and wife could each give $17,000 to their daughter, to their son-in-law, and to each of their grandchildren. So they're you know able to give collectively $34,000 to each, uh, each child, each child's spouse, each grandchild as well. Um, so there's you know, different things like that that you can also um, do that aren't very complex at all. It's just a form that you fill out with your taxes that shows that I gave this money away and it stayed within the uh, annual gift exclusion so it doesn't come off of your um, lifetime exemption as well. So we're going to continue to build into more of those strategies here in the next episode. And uh, I'll just keep going after this this tax animal. Hopefully at the end of you know these next well, maybe two two more episodes, we'll, um, we'll have a good basis of, of where you stand tax wise and, and how you could uh, use some other strategies to try to keep more of the money that you've earned thank you and as always if you're finding value with this please share with others uh, subscribe and we look forward to talking to you again soon thank you again for listening to wealth well done be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player and together we'll continue to improve our relationship with money and our effectiveness in stewarding it well